Allah. Okay, so we're about to get started. Welcome back to NUPI's 25th Annual Russia Conference. My name is Alana wilson Rove, and I'm delighted to be hosting a session on U.S. Arctic policy. With this panel, we are turning from Russia and China to get a perspective on U.S. Arctic aspirations and concerns. We can look forward to a continuation of this inquiry about U.S. Arctic politics with a great team of researchers coming up in the next panel as well. To this conversation, we're happy to welcome the newly appointed U.S. coordinator for the Arctic region within the U.S. Department of State. For many of us here in Norway, we remember Jim DeHart from another point in his long diplomatic career, that of Deputy Chief of Mission here in Oslo from 2015 to 2018. He has also had various appointments to regional security portfolios, so we plan in this session to consider and discuss some Arctic security issues as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Audience, also thank you to you for joining. Please do send in your questions at any time. I have a colleague moderating the Q&A who will be sending your questions along. So um, don't wait. The earlier you ask, the better. So, Mr. DeHart, it's great that you can be here with us. And I could start off with a starting point in um, an observation from one of our recently concluded research projects, this GPARC project. And really that project has shown that both cooperation and tension have been interlinked features of Arctic politics for a long time. We often tend to think of them as they're diverging, taking us in two different directions. Whereas if we look at a lot of key moments in Arctic politics, both are at play simultaneously. But nonetheless, what we have today is an amplification of change. The Arctic is undergoing this dramatic, if now predictable, transformation of its physical environment due to climate change. So there's a question, are we entering a chapter that's even more challenging to this, um, these practices of managing tension also through cooperation? But from a U.S. perspective, what are the major American Arctic security and governance challenges? To start with that first. Well, Alana, thanks so much. Uh... First, uh, for the invitation from NUPI, the chance to be here uh, with, with uh, everybody today. Uh, I had three great years in Norway. Uh, my friends get tired of hearing me talk about my fantastic assignment in Norway, but uh, it was a wonderful uh, experience working with such a close ally uh, on so many uh, important issues together. Uh, so now, um, uh, it, one of the joys of having this job is to be able to reconnect and uh, to work on this very important region of the Arctic. Uh, so if you'll allow me, I would just start with uh, a prediction, which is that, uh, is, is that people are going to see over the next months and years uh, an enduring commitment and involvement by the United States in the Arctic region uh, and a balanced approach. Uh, so uh, our involvement on security, on sustainable economic development, on trying to maintain a rules-based order through close cooperation among, uh, in particular, uh, the nations of the Arctic. And I make this prediction uh, with some confidence because it's a very easy case to make to our senior leadership that this is a critically important region. Uh, and for one of the reasons that you mentioned, Alana, the uh, dramatic physical changes that we're seeing in the region, I don't think there's another area of the world that is changing so quickly. And that invites uh, new players and activities uh, for better or for worse uh, into the Arctic. And these physical changes take place against a backdrop of geopolitical changes and a more assertive Russia and a more ambitious China, 
uh, and these are realities that we have to uh, address. And to be successful, we have to be very active uh, and we have to be very active together with our close friends and allies in the region. Perhaps I could take the opportunity just to follow up on this this point about um, an enduring commitment to the Arctic, that your position in and of itself is a new one in an old office. If you could tell us a bit about some of the recent kind of changes or reinforcements in the State Department, because one of the concerns that had many kind of observers of American Arctic politics had had were these empty um, appointments and positions relating to Arctic policy, many of which have been recently filled. Yeah, so um, uh, when our when our leadership took a look at at the region and uh, our posture, uh, uh, Secretary Pompeo and other senior leaders um, decided that we uh, needed um, to uh, have this position of coordinator make sure that we have a concerted coordinated approach and a balanced approach uh, across uh, our department and also that we're working across the federal government uh, with other um, with all the other many players in our system uh, who work on the arctic uh, we are really small uh, our office it's the it's the same office that existed some years back when admiral papp was the special representative uh, but my position is new um, and just somewhat different from Admiral Papp's um, with a with a slightly heavier emphasis on coordination of U.S. resources. But we have uh, we have a variety of bureaus across the State Department that do uh, a lot of fantastic work uh, on the Arctic. So um, uh, so really uh, my team and I are here to coordinate that work, to facilitate that work whether it's on security on NATO's northern flank or um, support for scientific uh, research and different forms of uh, cooperation. And we have a, a question from just following up on the, the region undergoing such dramatic transformations due to climate change. We had a question from the, the audience about how is the role of climate change included in the U.S. State Department's Arctic policies. I think sometimes, you know, given that the Trump administration has had their doubts about the validity of kind of international climate negotiations and so on, how does um, does that intersect in any way with how the State Department plans for um, a changing Arctic? Yeah. So we, uh, you know, we see very clearly the the dramatic environmental changes and physical changes that are happening throughout the region and. Uh, with um, often with a lot of very serious and negative impacts on people living in the region, including in our own uh, state of uh, state of Alaska, which is the reason the United States is an Arctic nation. Uh, so, <clears throat> so that's that's very clear the changes that are happening and the impacts. And I think uh, where we're focused in the context of the Arctic Council is uh, is. On and and beyond is on good science to understand uh, the the impacts and how this affects the rest of the world, and also how it in fact affects the uh, inhabitants of the region uh, and the local communities, and then looking at the steps that we can take together, the work that we can do together uh, to help communities mitigate those impacts, be more resilient and and adapt. And also one last thread coming in, also coming in from the question and answer when it comes to thinking about security challenges in the region. You mentioned that, you know, there's a more assertive Russia, a more ambitious China against this changing physical backdrop. One of the audience members has asked a question of whether there is some scope for discussing traditional security issues. And these are the issues that, as you know, and as we've talked about in previous panels that are traditionally kind of defined outside the remit of the Arctic Council. Is there any um, discussion <clears throat> of or uh, policy positions you can share about the whether this is a viable option for um, increasing dialogue in the Arctic? As one of the, you know, something we often hear coming out of the analytical community is of course this idea of a more open and trafficked Arctic, also possibly a more securitized Arctic. Is this real concern for vertical escalation, the idea that there could be an accident, a miscommunication, a misperception 
but in a broader environment of international some distrust across kind of the east-west divide could escalate unnecessarily. So what it, where do you think, if at all, that these traditional security issues maybe should have a home for dialogue? Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's a question that I've that I've heard uh, quite a bit since uh, coming into this job six, seven weeks ago. Uh, the first point I would make is uh, that, well, first, full support from the United States for the Arctic Council. This is a this is a forum that, from our perspective, works very well, serves the interests uh, of its members, and so we're going to remain very active and work through the Arctic Council. Um, and uh, so we're very attached to that body. Uh, the Arctic Council, from from our perspective, um, shouldn't be dealing with hard security issues. Uh, no plans to introduce uh, that topic uh, there. Um, we, of course, uh, need to have those conversations with our close friends and allies uh, in the region, uh, and we do bilaterally. And we should also think, I think, together with our close friends and allies about whether there are additional formats that would be uh, useful for us to uh, um, to to have discussions of, of sensitive issues that cannot take place in the Arctic Council. Um, so we're we're talking to our allies about that and 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 looking at that ourselves. Uh, I think when it comes to uh, a country like Russia, we do have uh, mechanisms uh, for notification of exercises, for transparency, um, uh, through the NATO context, through the OSCE, and um, and we are transparent, and NATO is transparent. Uh, we look for the same level of transparency uh, from Russia uh, for the reasons that you outline to make sure that uh, to guard to guard against uh, any any possible misunderstandings or or mishaps. Um, and so, you know, I think that we we have the channels to do that. Um, if there's more effective uh, ways of doing that, we could perhaps consider it. But um, but I would I would want to turn first uh, to our well established and existing um, uh, channels that we have, um, and also uh, I think you know, very importantly, to guard against any perception that we're going back to some business as usual with Russia in terms of our security dialogue with them, uh, which of course is, um, we made those changes uh, deliberately uh, back in 2014 following Russian violations of Ukrainian sovereignty. Uh, and uh, and the, um, for a variety of uh, reasons and activities coming from Russia, the, the relationship has remained difficult since then. So, you know, we can't we can't simply jump back to that business as usual. Um, that's an important uh, context as well. Thank you for that answer, and I think that leads us perfectly into kind of a next section of um, discussion. Uh, because kind of one of the issues that we see coming up repeatedly and how we interpret and talk, analyze the Arctic region is this question of in um, the environment of sanctions in this kind of the deliberate changes that were that were made after Russia's annexation of Crimea, what we see is this concern of well about Russia-China convergence, and it's debated back and forth the extent to which and these investments in the Russian Arctic, how many of them there are, extent, likelihood of how much more. But is there any concern in kind of Washington policy circles over potential China? Russia convergence and the or is the region in some ways is the Arctic framing of the region so valuable to all the Arctic states that we're likely to see a continuation of the of the lines of um, kind of agreement that were established especially in the Lulisat Declaration and in the background of the law of the sea. Yeah, thanks. Um, so. So we've seen some uh, cooperation between Russia and China in the Arctic region, and I think um, uh, the cooperation on uh, LNG from Yamal sort of stands out uh, with the uh, uh, the Chinese investment in, in shipping there. Um, and, uh, you know, and this and this, of course, takes place in a context of of um, of, of their 
their cooperation in, in some forms um, outside of the Arctic region uh, as well. But I think I, I think it there's some there's a foundational issue here and that uh, Russia is a uh, is an Arctic nation uh, with a with a good portion of the Arctic population and um, and territory above the Arctic Circle. China is not an Arctic nation. And I think that um, there are some uh, resulting limits to their cooperation. I think that, uh, and some divergences in their interests. I think, I think Russia uh, has an interest in, in guarding its position as an Arctic nation and in the Arctic Council. <clears throat> and so, um, so I, I'm not sure there's a complete convergence there that would enable that cooperation to rise to the strategic level beyond um, sort of the tactical at this point. Um, <clears throat> but we have to, uh, of course, uh, look at that um, it, in the context of our desire to keep uh, standards high in the region, to uphold the high principles of, uh, of governance and the rules-based order. Uh, uh, so that um, so that we're working toward the kind of uh, uh, standards and the kind of um, peaceful cooperation uh, and good governance that that uh, that that we want together with our friends and allies. Thank you for that. And I think having now we've gone into this question of sort of the dynamics of rivalry, but there all are also we have an interesting question coming out of the the Q&A, there are also some disagreements between allies as well. And maybe the Northwest Passage is one of the examples that we come, come back to again. So we have this question coming in from the audience. Say, and the question is such that, that um, last year, the Secretary of State referred to the Canadian legal stance on the Northwest Passage as illegitimate. How do you view that? And does it open up for potential transits for China and Russia in the Northwest Passage? I have to admit, I'm not a, that is outside of my area of competence, but we will, I will pose it to you and see if um, in some ways, maybe the broader framing is also that how well equipped do you think are also countries that are perhaps close friends in the Arctic for managing these sorts of disagree, kind of foundational disagreements as well? Yeah, I think that um, close friends and allies can have, um, can have uh, legal disagreements over, over, um, uh, uh, when you uh, over over some technical aspects, including on you know elements of uh, navigation, um, but I think I think the the important point here when when uh, when we look at our Canadian allies is the is the depth of the relationship overall, and though we might have a legal and technical uh, difference of views. Uh, there's no question that we're going to continue to have close cooperation with Canada. And I think um, in the larger, from a larger perspective to uh, work with Canada, uh, including in the region. So um, I, I would not anticipate that that would get in the way whatsoever. So now I think we'll turn towards the question of diplomacy, picking up on your support about how and full support for the Arctic Council as an important multilateral setting. And that's good to hear because I think one of the things that, of course, we've all, the Trump administration has evidenced is some skepticism towards the value of multilateralism and of diplomacy in some settings, including airing concerns about but the NATO alliance. But first, turning to this question of Arctic, I mean, the United States leadership on Arctic issues have been extremely important at pivotal, pivot, pivotal moments in our, the history of Arctic cooperation, leading, for example, very frequently with Russia on a lot of the binding agreements that really helped substantiate the claims of the Alulisat Declaration and showing that the Arctic is a governed space and that the Arctic countries can cooperate amongst themselves to ensure that um, future challenges in the Arctic are handled in a peaceful and effective way. But one of the challenges, we talked earlier about vertical escalation of conflict, but also in an environment where there's an increasing concern for military tensions, military exercises. In some ways, diplomacy can become a more difficult tool to sell in to domestic audiences, to capitals and so on, you know, with the chance that some of the important um, 
diplomatic efforts, often some of which are kind of quiet, proceed rather slowly, but really help form the, the backbone of our regional governance, may be overlooked or undervalued. So I wondered, what do you think are the prospects and priorities for cooperation in the Arctic? Where might we be expecting the US to put its um, diplomatic effort in the next, next few years? Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, so for, for those who support uh, multilateral approaches and solutions, uh, I think there's some good news here, which is the US is fully committed uh, to, uh, to the Arctic Council and to this forum. Uh, we see it as uh, very effective and very appropriate uh, and, um, and reflecting extremely well the, the interests of, of its members. Uh, and we and we put um, we really put priority on the eight nations of the Arctic, uh, their sovereignty, their jurisdiction. When you look at the fact that um, around seventy percent of um, resources uh, that could potentially be extracted are within the um, exclusive economic zones uh, of of six literal Arctic states. Um, this this is a region that, you know, governance uh, primarily uh, is the domain of those countries that are in the region and in alignment, of course, with um, international conventions and the law of the sea comes to mind in the United States, although we're not a formal party, uh, we do uh, respect and uh, and follow uh, the law of the sea. So, you know, this, this is very important to us. We want to have a region that is governed by rules um, and where rules uphold high standards. I think as we look ahead uh, in the, uh, the Arctic Council, we should ask ourselves, what is the, what is the next big effort that the Council should undertake? Uh, in the past, we've negotiated um, very cooperatively among the members uh, agreements on search and rescue, on marine pollution, on most recently uh, scientific uh, uh, cooperation, collaboration under the US chairmanship. And, and so I think that we should be ambitious and think about what is that, what is that next domain and next effort that we should try to make together uh, as as friends and allies in the region. Thank you for the, the view on um, on that future upcoming diplomacy. There are a few questions that have come in. One is about the position of kind of the Arctic Five, you know, the littoral, the Arctic coastal states. Do you see that as a viable forum to address regional policy questions? And then also is the chance this, although you've said this question ties into this idea of allies that it might be more NATO countries. However, often when you've spoken, you've spoken about the Arctic countries as well. So do you see the Arctic Council as a, a viable channel to continue to work with Russia on Arctic issues? Or will the emphasis shift to other formats, other dialogues, maybe bilateral with um, closer allies? Well, I think for us, the, the Arctic Council will remain front and center uh, for us. And, and we would not want to devise any other formats that in some way diminish the role of the Arctic Council. I think I would say that right right off the bat. Uh, what we do at NATO is very important and um, uh, we think that uh, NATO needs a very strong focus on its northern flank, uh, on maritime, uh, on the Arctic region, on the high north as it's referred to uh, at NATO. And then um, I, I guess I wouldn't uh, I I wouldn't weigh in on behalf of any further particular format because I think it it depends on the topics to be discussed uh, and and it may be that that we would want to convene in in a certain format depending on uh, different different topics um, but but we should have the flexibility I think as as friends and allies to to uh, to be able to do that. Um. And a few more questions on politics before we wrap up and turn to our broad question about the, the future. One of the issues that often comes, Greenland often comes up when we talk about the, the Arctic. It's a little, you know, that it is a, 
uh, country and homeland of the Greenlandic people, it's often kind of brought up as this almost chess piece between China's going to build airports there until you know Denmark comes in and makes sure that that's financed in other ways, or that the U.S. you know has a special interest in increasing its presence. Can you kind of update us on kind of the trajectory of U.S. policy in Greenland, and is that any specific? Is that a specific policy area, or is it just part of the Arctic strategy and interest areas more generally? Right. Well, um, it, Greenland is a um, is an important partner and also part of the region as we look uh, across the region. Um, so, we have some very exciting things happening uh, with Greenland and in close uh, uh, cooperation with uh, with the Kingdom of Denmark. Uh, we opened a consulate in Nuuk, Greenland in June, uh, and this is a very significant event, and particularly when you look at our finite resources for opening dip diplomatic platforms around the world, um, this is very significant. Uh, we now have a diplomatic presence there in Nuuk uh, to engage with Greenlanders um, across Greenland, of course, and not only in Nuuk, uh, and, um, and a, a basis to to uh, to uh, engage with different communities and to uh, pursue different cooperative activities. Um, we have a uh, uh, $12 million assistance package um, that will increase our ability to work with the Greenlanders and to share experiences and best practices in a variety of areas, including on um, uh, development of Greenland's resources. And so there's a lot happening. There's a lot happening that's very good with Greenland at the moment. And um, and also uh, with the government in Copenhagen, uh, and we've had uh, uh, many discussions with them. Uh, when Secretary Pompeo traveled um, earlier uh, this summer uh, to Copenhagen, he had a um, somewhat unprecedented uh, meeting together with uh, uh, the Danish Foreign Minister and the ministers of Greenland and the Faroe Islands. Uh, and and I think all this should signal uh, our our interest in the broader region and also our interest in being the partner, uh, a partner of choice with the Greenlanders. Uh, and, um, you know, to to extend that relationship uh, that we've had over many decades, and we have a strong historic relationship uh, with, uh, with Greenland. So um, there's a great deal happening there. Um, on China that we, we haven't really talked much about yet uh, today, but look, China, not an Arctic nation, but with um, clear ambitions and has hinted that they want to uh, be a part of governance um, in the Arctic region. And and uh, frankly, we see um, governance as the primary domain of the, of the Arctic states, um, uh, governance and cooperation working very well there. And we look at China's involvement with um, quite a bit of concern when we consider their activities elsewhere in the world. Uh, when we um, look at um, how their fishing fleets have decimated um, uh, certain fisheries around the world, when we look at how they've come in heavy, um, uh, particularly on the African continent, uh, with um, with with a lot of cash up front, no strings attached, apparently, um, development strategies, um, loans uh, that on the surface and at first glance seem to be a good deal. Um, but in fact, um, come at the expense of uh, labor uh, standards, uh, environmental standards, um, and, and have stoked um, a good deal of corruption. So when we look at the Chinese experience elsewhere, we have to be, you know, we have to have our eyes open in the Arctic region um, because we have a real interest in keeping standards there high. Well, and we're about out of time, so I don't, we can't pursue that line of inquiry much further, but I can recommend to our listeners who are and audience members who have just joined to check out the, as soon as we get it posted, the recording of our panel on China that preceded this conversation where these issues are, are discussed in detail. But for one last question to you, what kind of Arctic do you and your team hope that we'll have in 2030? Will we be here at the Russia annual Nupi's 35th annual Russia conference in 10 years and discussing the same thing? Or do you think we'll have engaged in diplomatic and governance efforts that move us forward? And also the place of, you know, that the Arctic is, you know, the homeland to indigenous 
peoples and a lot of Arctic residents, how can their voices and positions be amplified in the, the making of Arctic policy? Uh, you know, I think between now and then, I really think that um, key decisions will be made that are going to shape the region for generations to come. And and we'll, we will likely see significant change and we need to make sure that we work uh, with real determination over the next uh, uh, few years and, and out to, you know, to the decade um, to get this right. Um, and what we want to see is a, uh, a, reg a region that remains peaceful and where countries are cooperating well and where scientific research is taking place. And I think importantly that those actors that are coming in for economic reasons are developing the resources in the region carefully, wisely, uh, with close attention to the environment uh, and to sustainability, and very importantly, um, uh, in a way that is supportive to local communities, including indigenous communities across the entire region. And I think for that to happen, you need indigenous voices um, as part of this conversation. But that's the kind of ar Arctic that we seek. Um, we recognize there is a security dimension, uh, but we favor low tension and cooperation in this very important region. Well, thank you, Jim, for joining us today to have this discussion about U.S. Arctic politics. It was um, very nice that we could talk to you so early in your start in this interesting and important new position. Um, I'd also like to thank our audience for their questions and participation. We've woven in many of them, but if you didn't get your question answered, you do have another chance as we have an excellent seminar, another one coming up. It's a researcher converse conversation on the same topic, which is U.S. Arctic po politics and great power rivalries. So you'll find the link both in our Q&A section and on our website if you need to, to find your way there. Thank you again to our speaker and the audience, and we look forward to seeing you in the next session. Thank you, Alana. Appreciate the invitation. Hope, hope to be there in person next time. We hope so too. Thank you.